hurt anybody. That. No, but that That's doesn't mean you're hurt. That doesn't mean you're hurting them. That could mean you just took them with you to space and gave them a, a better jo- job and better life. That's exactly yeah, what did. they do. We, he, he, That's yeah, exactly what we do. We explain that. We turn their us. brains back on. Humans are only using ten percent of their brains. Not all of them. <laughs> you well, you have suffered a catastrophic genetic side effect of the inbreeding process. Because you're, you're part ape and part us. You know, we lived here on this planet for over 12,000 years. From about 52,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. And we were friends with what was called the Simeon Nation. There was a race of people Simeon? on this planet. And they were apes. Okay. Hold on, hold on, uh, Bruce. It's Simeon, you said, right? Simeon Nation. Yes, the Simeon Nation. Okay, so Simeon. What he's going to tell you guys about right now, and you got to visualize in the, the movie Planet of the Apes, but even way more advanced. But there was a race of, of apes, of, of very intelligent, loving, caring apes. That uh, talk, talk about that and when that was, and then what happened with that. Was it 40,000 or 52,000 or 65? However many millions or thousands of years ago. Talk about that, please. No, it wasn't millions of years ago. It was 53,000 years ago when our planet was destroyed. We lost 49 billion people in one single day. But we had 3.5 billion people that were still alive on the surface of Mars at the time. And in addition to that... We had this repository of all of these vials of blood for tens of billions of people. See, we, we keep vials of blood from our people so that if we have to identify their remains, because there's a war in progress, you are doing the same thing. We can identify somebody through their genetic remains. Uh, what ended up happening was uh, that because of the massive loss of life, uh, when we came to the Earth and kind of got settled in here, we started a cloning program and started cloning all these people that were dead. And that's how I was brought back the first time. Okay, and, and, and where do their so- You said the souls go uh, with to God, but then when, when you clone them, how, how, why, why would the same soul go back to that body that's cloned? It isn't necessarily. I don't think I'm the same soul. I just have the same memories. You know, I was trying to explain. See, that's how complicated things are. You know, there was a story I told him. I hope you don't mind me repeating it. There was a well, little actually, girl. I, bef- she was about okay. 10 if- years old. She was attacked by somebody who raped her and then beat her literally to death with a hammer. When they found her, they took the heart out of that little girl and put the heart in another 10-year-old little girl whose heart was failing. And it, and it took, and it was perfect. The girl was fine. The problem was that the girl that had the new heart started dreaming of the guy murdering her. She knew his name, she knew his address, she I, knew where he lived. This. So the parents, uh, after the little girl told all this information to her parents, they gave that information to the police. The police went to the guy's house with a search warrant, and in his garage they found a hammer in there that still had pieces of brain matter and blood on it that was from that little girl. I've heard the so story, the yeah, is, so that's a true story? You no. Know, yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. You know, every mm-hmm. time you transplant tissue from one person into another person, there's also a transplant of information. Because I don't know how, exactly yeah. how it all happens. Okay. You know, the brain okay. controls the information. I'll accept but that answer. That's a good answer, sir. The significant events of a person's life okay, hang on a are sec. recorded at a genetic level. Right. Bruce, Bruce, I, okay. I'm going to ask some questions. Bruce. i got to ask some Please. questions from the chat room. Uh, okay. That was a good answer um, uh, for that one. Um, 
I'm going to have to let ponder that. I think it was a pretty good answer. Uh, the Chinese going to the dark side of the moon. What happened there with their recent probes? I don't know. Okay. I'm not. I'm not up on the Chinese. Oh, I just I, thought I you might know. I, uh, I don't trust a whole lot of stuff from the Chinese. So you don't. You're not up on what's they, going on right now. Recently on the dark side of the moon. They're not. You know, like, there's there's a. There's a lot of Chinese people. Well, they sent probes up there. That's all. UFO photos. There's a lot of uh, like uh, you'll see it on the uh, YouTube and on the internet. You'll see these things, real UFO photos, and you know if they're from China, they're probably just fake. There's a lot of fake stuff out there, and that's why I'm here. I'm trying to help people sort through all the muck and mire to get to the basic facts of what are go- what is going on. Okay, were the moon missions real? The United States moon missions, were they real? What we saw on TV, was that real? Well, uh, I'll tell you what I think, and it's just an opinion, okay? I believe that they actually went to the moon, but I don't believe it was the same guys they told you it was. You know, if they send three guys to the moon and they die, they don't want anybody to know that. So uh, what they did was they sent, like, Neil Armstrong up, and all he did was fly around the Earth in, in uh, orbit. And that way, you know, they superimposed pictures between the two events, you know. And so uh, Neil Armstrong got the credit for having landed on the moon, but... There's a lot of stuff that you don't know about, like those uh, X-15 missions. You know, the United States was already in space and had already sent satellites to Mars before the Russians ever once sent that first satellite up into space. And they made a big deal about the Russians, you know, being the first in space. They sent Sputnik up, and they had the first man in space, and the first woman in space. And it's all bunk. You know, it was all complete bunk. Because the government of the United States didn't want to be the only country that was sending people into space. So this was kind of the best way they could get the Russians behind it, you know. So they let them take credit for everything. So, but uh, I think the United States has gone to the moon. I just don't believe it's the same guys that uh, they tell you it was. And, I mean, look, look at that, uh, the space shuttle uh, Discovery. Is that the one that uh, blew up as it was taking oh, off? Oh, yes, yeah. What happened there? The Challenger. You know, I looked at these photos. If you look it up on the Internet, They have found what appears to be six of the seven astronauts, and they're still alive. And there's no explanation as to why they should be alive. Where? And it's weird because uh, four of the six haven't even bothered to change their names. And the two that did change their names, they just changed their first name. You know, like uh, like uh, the uh, the Japanese guy. His name was Ellison Anazuka. Well, this reporter went to the Anazuka residence just to uh, interview the family to ask him how they were getting along. Uh, all these years, it's been thirty years or something since the space shuttle disaster. And this guy came and answered the door. And he claimed his name was Claude Anazuka, except he was the spitting image of the original astronaut. And when the reporter asked him, he said he was the identical twin brother of the guy who was killed in the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. You know, uh, so even if you did a genetic test on him, it, it would be identical to the original guy. But, you know, there's something else going on. And so uh, I happen to know, uh, have some inside proof about uh, the space shuttle missions. You know, they shut down the space shuttle missions because of something that took place in Williams, Arizona. You know, uh, in Williams, Arizona, uh, there was a, a large triangular ship. 
and it was fired on by F-16s, and they blew it out of the sky. Okay, hold on. Let me let me let me stop you there. This is this is in two thousand seven or two thousand six, correct? Yeah, it was December of two thousand and seven. They okay, had a man on the surface, now, what, and they were trying to retrieve. What were you doing there it. that day? And what people were around you, and what was what was happening there that day when this went down? If just kind of tell us a little bit about that, so we under, can picture this. All right. Well, uh, I I had. I've been in intensive care on eight different occasions from attempts on my life. I had had a, a, an attempt on my life and had some serious injuries, and I had to go to a hospital, and while they were doing surgery, they removed my two tracking chips. I had these two little chips. I had one in my right sinus passage, one in my left forearm, and while I was unconscious, they removed the tracking chips. But these are implants, well, uh, we call also, correct? Pardon? These are implants, not right? tracking chips. Implants that you yeah. had, like what we call alien implants is what you're referring to, correct? Yeah, it, it would allow my people to find me. and they used So to these come, implants were put uh, in by your people? The Nephilim, the people of Mars. I'm a Martian, correct. basically. Okay, okay. So, they had re so you had surgery, they removed these implants... Right, and then you, and, and so how did, and then what led to you going to to Williams uh, in, in in the desert and experiencing that that ship? And I want to, we so, want to hear the story because the ship story is amazing. You know, the people of Mars, it's going to be hard for you people to understand. They all use one hundred percent of their brains, and it's it makes everything immensely different. You can have like a town hall meeting, and everybody will show up, and nobody is actually there, you know, because they're all sitting back in their quarters on like a lazy boy recliner, and they're astral projecting to the site. They can astral project over long distances. They can send their consciousness. They're telepathic, you know. They, they see everything that's going on here. You know, you guys don't realize that everything that is going on on this planet is being observed. You can't go to the bathroom without these guys knowing that you've gone to the bathroom. They know how many pieces of toilet paper you use. You know, the thing is that after my tracking chips were removed, because I am what's considered an historic icon, you know, they... Um, our people thought that they were giving you a present by bringing me back to life and letting me live amongst you as one of you. And the thing is that uh, when they took the tracking ships, they were worried what was going to become of me. So this woman, she uh, contacted me psychically. She asked her projected. And uh, it, it was a long event, but to make a long story short, uh, after the communication... She told me where to go. She said, you have an area up there where you've been camping, right? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, you know, to the uh, east of you there, there's a good open area of about 20 to 30 miles that you can see. You know, it's a big, long valley. And I said, yeah. And she says, well, go there because we're going to come and we're going we're gonna to get you out of there. So I said, sure, fine. So uh, I went there and was parked in a van. And uh, I got up on top of my van and was standing in the middle of the luggage rack, and I had this flashlight that plugs into the cigarette lighter, and I saw the ship come in. And I started flashing them because I had a million-watt light bulb in this thing. You could guide in a 747 with this thing with no problem. So I started flashing them. When suddenly I was blown right off the top of the van by these F-16s that blew like 10 feet over my head. And they came up on me so fast, I didn't even hear them. They just hit me like a bullet flying past my head and literally blew me off the top of the van. Uh, but luckily, I, I, I'm kind of... Uh, athletic, a little bit athletic, and uh, I managed to twist around and get a hold of the 
luggage rack, and I stopped myself from falling and breaking bones, but I pulled myself up, and just as I did, I looked up, and all these F-16s let out a line of missiles. And I stood there and watched these missiles go across the air from the F-16s, and it hit the ship. And the ship exploded. It looked like the Hindenburg disaster. Oh, and the thing fell to the ground, and it crashed. And uh, it started this massive forest fire. And uh, I sat there all night long watching this fire, and uh, I could see across this field. There was like about 20 miles in between me and this thing. And there was all these lights, red, blue, yellow, you know, flat, uh, hundreds of them out there. Uh, so uh, the next morning, I could see that there was huge plumes of smoke going up. And uh, I drove over into Williams, Arizona. And uh, when I got into town, the main reason I went there was to see if people noticed all these plumes of smoke. And uh, when I got into town, I noticed that all over town, there was these racks that were set in front of all the businesses. And it had a big sign on it that says, Free. Take one. And I walked up and looked, and it was a newspaper. It said something like the Williams Times. And it said, uh, their main story on it, it said, Forest Service starts prescribed burning today. So they already had a cover story in place for these huge plumes of smoke. And it was just directly west of Williams, but just on the other side of this row of mountains that are there. So uh, that's how quickly they had a, a cover story in place. But the thing I want to point out to people, that ship was armed to the teeth. They could have blown all those F-16 fighter jets right out of the sky. But they didn't even have their deflector shields on. They didn't, they didn't have anything on. They were sitting there with all of their offensive equipment on the off position. And the only reason that they would have done that is if they had declared that they were on a search and rescue mission. You follow? So that they were basically our version of a Red Cross ship. And the United States government knew that. These pilots must have known that. And they fired on it anyway. And the captain that was on that ship, he must have thought that these are dummy missiles, that they're, like, going to hit the hull and just, you know, bounce off or something. Because he probably never believed for an instant that the United States would actually fire on his ship. But they did. And the thing is, they were looking for me. And it's weird that nobody has investigated it. Because I sat there and watched them for day after day after day after day as they were flying in these offsprees. I think that's what they call them. It's those huge transport planes with the large propellers that face up and down. Yes. You know, so that these planes kind of land like helicopters. Yeah. And Take almost on an hourly that. basis, they that were is. loading up the wreckage from this ship. So... uh I know that probably over a thousand people were killed by the United States, that were, and it was murder. It was just straight out murder. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what led to it, but I'm sure it has something to do with our enemies because we're at war. But uh, the United States has been playing ball with uh, some of these uh, grays, what you call grays. Yeah. And they are our enemies. We are okay, hold on, at check, war hold on, time out, Bruce, with do you, them. Do you want to go to a break, Wolfman, or do you got any questions? Because this, no, uh, this is an interesting part on of the story. No, the, the break's not yet. I actually want to... Okay, my bad. Um, in a few minutes, though, I'm not sure what we got here. Uh, when, oh. you, when you hear the music come in, then it's break. Good, good. Okay. Because uh, I, I was going to tell you something. You know, uh, the United States got spanked over it. They burned the Johnson Space Center. And it's never been made public. The whole NASA facility there in Fort Worth was lit up like a Christmas tree. By your they people, burned right? it. 
That was in 2011. And as a result, the United States shut down the space shuttle fleet permanently. And it wasn't because they were trying to save money or anything. It's because they're afraid that if they send the space shuttle out there now, they'll get fired on. And they might. Now, I want to be clear about something. When I say it's our guys, I, I don't mean that it's the Nephilim people themselves. It's the humans that we have drafted. You know, I never quite finished that. You know, 80% of the people that we take off of the planet, we are simply relocating them to one of a dozen other worlds. And these people, a, they, when they wake up, a, uh, they uh, think an, an, that they're still on an, the an, earth. An, They'll walk outside, there's oxygen to breathe, there's blue sky, there's trees, there's cattle. They do not realize that they are not on the earth, you know. But Adam has a question for you, sir. Bruce? Can of the people that we take, as, you know, like 20%, we just plain draft them in the military service. Which is something I mentioned to him about the Bermuda Triangle. You know, people have heard the stories about the Bermuda Triangle and all those thousands of ships, planes, and people that have disappeared. But, you know, nobody has ever once laid a finger on a Carnival Cruise Line, have they? So the point here, there, is that we don't take people at random, and it's not about numbers. Everything that has been taken was stuff that had military applications, like the Cyclops, that famous ship. That was a naval ship that was brimming over with military supplies. It had morphine, medicine, bandages, K-rations, uh, battlefield beverages, uh, firearms, ammunition, you know. And the thing is, there's a war going on right over your head, and we're fighting a war to sa trying to save you from extinction, and we figure that you should be contributing to the war effort. So sometimes we just plain take your toys away from you. And that's all there is to it. We love to get our hands on your pilots, like that Flight 19. Flight 19, if you guys knew about Flight 19, that was us. We took the whole squadron. We even took the search and rescue planes. But you know what we do? is we turn their brains back on. We turn on 100% of their brains, and once that happens, they never want to come back. They could come back if they wanted to. Some of them have come back and got their family members and put their family members through the same process, but none of them ever want to be around humans ever again. So what we'll do is we'll, like, take these pilots and we'll train them to fly our stuff. And we, we do a lot of that. You don't even realize it's right in front of your face. You know, on about every year, year and a half, you'll see something in the papers where they'll say, you know, two pilots crashed while uh, in a training mission or something, you know. But what you don't realize is that these guys could eject seconds from impact and they'd still be fine. There's no reason for them to be dead. So when the government tells you that two pilots kill each other by crashing into each other, that's when we take them. We'll take two out of America, uh, two out of Canada, two out of Mexico, two out of France, two out of Germany, two out of Russia, like that, you know. We turn the brains back on and then we...
hours of material one time. 16 hours. And I never All touched right. on the same subject matter. We are before. back on live. This is Marvin Spacely, and we are back on. Uh, and by the way, you, you can, can listen on TuneIn Radio if you search for Monster, Monster Castle Paranormal. Paranormal. Call in to the show on Skype at Wolfman Mike 47 or 775-990-8447. In Canada, 226-271-3466. And that was Melvin Spacely. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, you know, let me just nice uh, jump throw something here out there real quick. So that people so what, can what you've been discussing something. is your people, you, the Nephilim. You may have heard terms like uh, the little green men from Mars. You know, there was a race of people that evolved on this planet right here, the one that you're standing on. And they evolved during the period that the dinosaurs were here. They are basically dinosaurs with a brain. And in their original form, they were varying shades of green, as is common to reptile species. But their skin photosynthesized certain chemicals the way our skin photosynthesizes vitamin D. And uh, as a result of lack of direct sunlight on their skin over the course of millions of years, that race of people have continued to fade in color until they attained the pasty gray color that they're known for today. But they are real. They're not like interdimensional something, you know, even though they have interdimensional abilities, but that's the result of their technologies. Those grays are physical. They're real, and you can walk up and shake hands with them. And if anybody thinks that they're not real, if they think that people are making this up, I've got something I'm going to throw at you here. You know, there's a face on Mars called uh, Sidonia, the face in Sidonia. It's the one that Richard Hoagland has been showing everybody for decades. The problem is that Richard Hoagland has been showing the face upside down. No shit. If you get a good look at it. I have turned it over. Turn it around the opposite direction. There's a total different face. What you think is two eyeballs is where the two shoulders are. And there's a little neck... And the thing that you think is the mouth is actually the eyebrow ridge. And what it is, it's a monument to the grays. And it's old. It's like 65 million years old. And it goes to show you how far back all of this started. Because those grays, they had a nuclear war here on the earth. And they blew the earth away. And as a result, they created a nuclear winter that froze this planet solid as the rock of Gibraltar in an event that your scientists call Snowball Earth, during which time you could have walked from Africa to South America and never once got your feet wet. And it remained that way for millions and millions of years. So to these reptiles, this was the worst possible scenario. And at some point... They completely abandoned the earth and and never even looked back. You know, they actually went out into other star systems and colonized a number of worlds, and they had a, a really long history. But at some point, they decided that all the good worlds were already taken. They, are, they already had uh, forms of man living on them. So they decided that they were going to conquer the galaxy, and the place that they wanted to start was our planet. Our planet was about 20 times the size of the Earth, but it had 11 moons, so it didn't quite have uh, 20 times the gravity, even though the gravity was significantly higher, but uh, a number that comes into play all the time for us is the number 26. It's a lucky number for us. You know, uh, you think that the number 13 is, is uh, bad luck, right? 
but if you add two 13s together, two negatives make a positive. It's 26. You know, the galaxy takes 26,000 years to rotate one time. The thing is that uh, our planet was 260 million miles from the Earth. And uh, we had about 260 different countries. And uh, we had a year that was actually 1,040 days in length. But uh, we split it up like a leap year so that uh, we had a calendar that was only 260 days in length. But there were four of them back to back. And that was a year to us. And uh, our year had 10 months and each of the 10 months was made up by 26 days, and uh, our days were 26 hours in length. And one of the things that people ask all the time is about the surface temperature. Well, you know, we were so far away from the sun that, you know, the sunlight only affected maybe 10 to 15 percent of our actual surface temperature. The majority of our surface temperature was the result of geothermal heat radiating out from the planet. And our planet, which was covered in these massive oceans, all these oceans were like heated swimming pools. So uh, that's one of the things that people will have a hard time understanding. Our planet was very, very unstable. We had earthquakes on almost a daily basis. And it went on like this for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And we developed really extraordinary technologies, and we got the whole planet under control and started using all of the natural forces to our benefit. And the whole planet was just covered with fruits and vegetables. We had lots of land. We had lots of food. Uh, but uh, we didn't have war. That's something that people need to know. We didn't even have a word for war in our language. You know, we had lost so many people in catastrophes. You know, the idea of one of us killing one of our own kind was abhorrent to us. So, you know, we had this huge military. It was like a United Nations military. And we had Army and Navy they were there to take life. They were there to save life. Our army was like the Army Corps of Engineers. And our Navy and their Air Forces would deliver food where it was needed or would evacuate people out of uh, catastrophically hit areas, you know. We had our planet completely down to where we turned it into a total utopia. There was no wars on our planet. We did have firearms, admittedly, but that was because some of the wild animals on our planet uh, were quite vicious. You know, we had stuff that was so big and so mean, they could have used one of your grizzly bears to uh, pick its teeth. So we did have firearms, but we didn't have war. The thing is that uh, we had 11 moons, and we had started colonizing these 11 moons, but, and we had, uh, you know, like international space stations and that kind of thing, and we were picking up transmissions that were going from uh, Mars out into uh, the farthest reaches of the galaxy, and uh, there was these reptilian people, and they were talking about the shortages of food and material, and, you know, uh, they were always complaining that they were starving. And they were, uh, a lot of them were hibernating. They hibernated for years at a time. And uh, we made the mistake. We didn't understand because we didn't know what a war was. We called them. And we invited them to come over. We told them, you know, we've got a lot of land here and we've got food everywhere. You know, if you can get used to fruits and vegetables, you know, we can even provide cattle and other things because, you know, we, we're we not uh, vegetarians ourselves, to be honest, you know. We're not very predatory, not like some people, but uh, 
we invited them to come over, and they did. They came in mass. What kind and of? They began massacring us. Um, what kind by of? By the billions. Hallucinogenic. Oh, Bruce. What? Yeah. Okay. Bruce, I got, let him ask you some questions, please. Can I ask some questions uh, uh, from the chat room? Uh, who, wh- sure. who, one is who are you hiding from? And I thought it was the Greys or somebody. I don't know. Uh, no, okay, Bruce. I put in the chat room, Bruce, that you're you're staying in a hotel. Uh, that story is a long story because they they burned down his house two times. Uh, but anyway, you're you're kind of in hiding at the moment, right, Bruce? I mean, you, you're you don't really want the government knowing where you're ac- exactly located. Is that correct? Well. You know, I, I was telling him that uh, I lived on a mountaintop for seven years in a tent, hmm. and I was completely off the grid. And uh, the government, they, they searched and searched and searched, and they couldn't find me. So they they lit the entire mountain on fire. So you, what you're saying is the government and the Greys are working together, and that's why they're after you? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Who is after you? No, they're not after me because of what I am. They're after me because they don't want me telling you the story that I'm telling you right now. They don't want the public to know the real truth. <laughs> they don't want the Kinda public like to know that there William are Bill Cooper billions of people on Mars. You know the story of uh, the Europeans and the Indians? Uh, yes. You know, when, the, when the Europeans came over, they took over this country... Yeah. Well, the thing is, there's a civilization on the planet right next to you. It's populated by billions of people, and they're massively superior to human beings. They have advanced technologies that you couldn't even guess at. They could blow the whole surface of this planet away and not get a scratch. And the government's afraid that if they even admit that they really exist, that it will cause... A calamity and the world will collapse. They're worried about a, pu- a worldwide public panic taking place and rioting in the streets and all that kind of thing. So they have gone to great lengths to keep the public from knowing that we're there. But I want to say, for the record, we are not hiding from you. We have been doing everything. We have flown our battle stars over cities like Phoenix. We have sent flights of UFOs over Washington, D.C. in 1952. We have done everything possible to try to tell people who we are, where we're at, what we're doing. And, and, but there's so many aspects. You know, they can't just come down here and breathe the air because that's one of those nine steps, you know, the nine obstacles. You know, if they came to, if the people from Mars came over here and breathed the air, the germs would kill them. There's a lot of aspects taken into consideration, you know. So, uh, the way that they figured that they could take a first step at communicating with human beings is by putting people like me around the planet living amongst the human populations. There are aliens living amongst you that look just like human beings, except for my ears and the fact that my teeth were different. And, you know, there's other genetic differences, but you wouldn't see them. You know, there's stuff on the inside. You know, I have two arms, two legs, you know, a body like everybody else. You know, the only thing that would make me stand out is my pointed ears. You know, uh, oh, hey, I'm my... hey, can I cut in? Just a... Hey, man, yeah. this, Bruce. Uh, this is Young Nancy, man. I got a question for you, Bruce. So what, so you're saying you are an alien? Is that what I'm trying, is that what I'm picking up right now? But you only have pointed ears? I mean, explain to me that. Can you explain that to me? I, I've just, just jumped into the what? group chat. I didn't hear anything you said before. Please explain to me what makes you different. He did. Well, he my, was born my with, race, uh, my race look European in appearance, except that we all have pointed ears. But 40,000 years ago, the Simeon Nation was wiped out almost to extinction. 95% 
They had 36 the rows of teeth. Was wiped out. Or 30, 36 teeth instead of 32 as well. Yes. Yeah, my teeth are different than yours. My ears were different, you know. I have uh, hearing differences and sight differences, but it's minor, minor differences. The thing is that in, in order to prevent your extinction, we interbred with the simian nation to prevent them from becoming extinct because there wasn't enough of them left alive to repopulate the species. All of their biodiversity had been wiped out. There was a few thousand breeding pair left, but there wasn't enough to uh, repopulate the species. And in a relatively short period of time, you began showing the undeniable side effects of inbreeding, the first symptom of which is mental retardation. So in an effort to prevent your extinction, we did genetic modifications to you by giving you snippets of our DNA and mixing it with your DNA, and we were successful in preventing any further decline in your species. But as a result, we changed you from apes into the image that you are now, which is virtually identical to us, except that you have 32 teeth, where we have 36, and you have round ears, where we have pointed ears. See, you have some of my DNA in you right now. But 97% of your DNA is identical to a chimpanzee. So then what is... My bad to interrupt. What is your race that you're speaking of? I'm Nephilim. I'm a race that evolved naturally on the fifth planet of this star system. So the Nephilim... I am not here. Are they different from the giants from the Bible, or are you speaking of the same species? So those were our children. When we started interbreeding naturally, I mean, not in a laboratory setting, you know, when we uh, found some human female and said, well, I'd like to go have sex with this woman, you know, quite often the children would have birth defects. And it was the birth defects that led to the giganticism. Okay. So uh, some of these children that we had ended up eight, nine, ten feet tall. Um, but, uh, what do the Anunnaki have to do, do with all anymore. this? What about we the don't An- do that anymore. I, I meant to ask you before, how do the Anunnaki fit into all this, and can you speak any of those other languages? No, not presently. Not this time around. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't know it. But... Uh, you know, our people only speak one language. So I, I don't know where... And your people used to only speak one language. In fact, for centuries, your people didn't even use their vocal cords. You know, in fact, your vocal cords you got from us in the first place anyway, because primates don't have vocal cords. You know, all the traits that you have, you know, the, the, your feet are webbed now, and they're designed like two perfect paddles, perfect for swimming. Oh, per- you know, actually, you know, that's, for that's me, a, you know, a, uh, I, I thought you said earlier, me. I thought you said earlier that your, your people speak telepathically. They do. That's what I was saying. They, you know, they don't need to speak in words. They can communicate whole ideas and, and mind block with each other. And that's how human beings used to be. Your people, when you were apes, your people were smarter than you are now. When the people on this planet were apes, they were readily using technologies that you couldn't even guess at. And there's the, there's the thing, because I had to be put through a process where they systematically shut down percentages of my brain cells until they got me down to a level low enough that I could communicate with you on your level. Okay, also I asked about Anunnaki. What do you know about that? Well, that's that's the word that uh, Zachariah Sitchin uses, you know, in his uh, writings. But uh, that was something that I mentioned to Eric. You know, when uh, King James 
decided to translate the Bible into English for the first time. He had like 85 linguistic experts all checking each other's work, and they all had to agree with each other before they put it down into the Bible, and they wrote the King James Bible. Yet despite that, they still mistranslated things, and they still made mistakes. Here you have Zachariah Sitchin. He's supposedly translating stuff out of those Sumerian texts, and he's doing it all by himself. Nobody's checking his work. And if you ask anybody who actually is an expert in Sumerian languages, every one of them will tell you that they do not agree with his translation. 